I have to say it's, it's an enormous pleasure for me to be here this morning. Um, I should say that I'm here in a personal capacity. I you know, certainly would like to salute the work conducted by uh, Marjorie Equality on behalf of children. And when I was asked to speak at this conference, you know, I immediately uh, had no hesitation in accepting. And there are, because of other work commitments this year, you know, there are a few conferences I've decided to participate in, but I think that this is a particularly important one. And the reason I felt so strong about speaking this morning is because of what we've heard earlier this morning. And that is that this was about hearing the voice of children, hearing the experiences of children growing up in what we now know, the normal families with uh, very positive outcomes. And certainly what I would like to, to suggest this morning is that, that I would call on the, uh, the Office of the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs to commission broader research and to support broader research in this area. Because it, no matter what perspective you come from, the starting point has to be that uh, children need to be protected, whatever the family form is. What's what struck me over the last decade or so is that we get obsessed with the form of the relationship rather than the substance of the relationship and the unambiguous messages coming from research. And I can say this with a, a degree of authority. I've my, myself independently conducted a lot of research and I've had exposure right across, I suppose, not only the EU, but uh, across the common law world. What matters for children is actually the stability of the relationship. And what we need to be doing is we need to be supporting relationships. Uh, what annoys me is the fact that much of the discourse uh, certain quarters of the media in this area focuses on blatant prejudice, whether it's on the basis of sexual orientation or gender. And that uh, troubles me, it concerns me, because this isn't about children. This is about people being individual, uh, what I would call value preferences to bear, uh, without, with reckless disregard for, for outcomes. And I have to say, I just felt the, the presentations by Christine and Connor this morning were enormously powerful. And what they conveyed was this image of, of normality. I think it's the measure of any democracy, the manner in which we treat the needs of the most vulnerable. And children growing up, in my opinion, in what I would classify, and uh, forgive me if you, if you take offense to this, but I'd call new family forms, uh, I, I just feel that we have airbrushed them out of our consideration because it's not comfortable. And what uh, certainly we have a tendency to do is to say, well, we'll park that because it's not important. I think I was one of the, the certainly I was critical in terms of the civil partnership legislation, which I have to say I, I broadly support, but critical because of the fact that it, children were pretty much invisible. Because what we seem to do is we seem to think that we can package this issue into adult issues and issues relating to children. And this is, I suppose it conveys the image to me of, you know, sort of you have your, you know, what was formerly the, you know, your video player and you can press pause and hope that you can put the lives of children on hold for a period of years while we contemplate change. That just can't happen. And it, certainly it, I would like to, to endorse comments made by Fergus Finlay in this morning in the context of the children's referendum. I've been very vocal on the fact that uh, we need a change in this area. And I passionately believe that having a referendum enshrining the rights of children in the Constitution will have a very significant impact on children growing up in the context of new family forms. Because one of the core provisions in that proposal is around equality. And this is an issue of equality. It's treating children in all families in a similar fashion, regardless of the shape that that family takes. And that has to be important. Uh, last year, there was a very interesting and troubling decision of the High Court. And the High Court, this is nearly a quarter of a century after the enactment of the Status of Children Act uh, of, of 1987, which was intended to remove the, the stigma of what was then illegitimacy. And we had the High Court saying that children in non-marital families have a lesser right to proper provision and protection than children in marital families. And it went virtually without comment. And I just found that to be deeply troubling. And if there is a case for, for constitutional ca change, certainly one of the arguments has to revolve around that. Because we cannot discriminate against children on the basis of their family form. If we look at, we've heard the issue of bullying touched on. And I think we have made uh, some inroads in, in tackling that issue. 
But I, I do believe that schools need to be much more proactive not only in terms of having anti-bullying policies, and I'm conscious of the fact that the Department of Education you know, has been attempting to, to make change in this area, but also I, you know, I certainly would like to see uh, more prohibitive sanctions for schools that fail to implement those policies, because policies are all very fine, but it's uh, when those policies remain un unimplemented that they have profound implications for our children. So, so what I'm about, I suppose, what I'm going to talk about is I'm not going to get into the high-level legal argument because today is not about that. And it's certainly I've ri written a new book and the proceeds go to charity, so I'm not plugging the book, but I'm just anybody that's interested, I, uh, I, I, it's book runs to 1,400 pages, but it, it teases out comprehensively all of you know, these issues and where we might go, I suppose, as a model for the future, the issues that we might address. And I think we need to start thinking in, in short term, medium term, long term. Because I think the legacy of today's conference has to be, well, how can we build on the work, uh, the, the fantastic work uh, commenced in, in commissioning of this research and the writing of this research and in the, in the powerful, I, I think, presentations of both Connor and Christine. I think we need to follow through on that. Coming then to, to look at, uh, I suppose, the, the conventional meaning of the family is not merely a linguistic problem. The leaking construction of the family is a site of considerable controversy and symbolic conflict. But what is family? And I think we need to bring it back to basics. You know, we need to look at, and how do we build supports around the family? And I see uh, Pat from, from the Family Support Agency, and Pat's done fantastic work, and indeed has the Family Support Agency in actually moving in the right direction. Because uh, I think it was James Connolly that said family is about uh, the stronger uh, members of the family looking after the weaker and the most vulnerable members. And that's what we should be doing. It's about in those values or values we should be cherishing wherever they find expression. What are those, uh, th those type of values is commitment and sacrifice and caring for others, putting your needs behind others' needs and supporting each other through difficult times. And th that's what this is about. Now, if I can speak, I suppose, in terms of my own experience, over a, a number of years, I've been centrally involved in advising the, the Foster Care Association. And I've seen the outstanding work uh, performed, executed by same-sex couples on behalf of the state in actually providing a very impressive support for sometimes very vulnerable children. And I think sometimes we lose sight of this, that this, this fantastic work that has been uh, conducted and continues to be conducted. And we mount platitudes when we talk about giving effect to the voice of the child. And uh, you, you sometimes hear people saying it's, yeah, it's, and again, I was struck by what Connor was saying, as his symptoms, uh, this, referring to the symptoms, and it's about the children. But we really don't mean it, because when we say it's about the children, but it's really about us, and we'll package it in terms and say it's about the children. Because it's about hearing the children. We talk about our legislation. All of our legislation revolves about uh, the, the welfare of the child as a first and paramount consideration and this type of legal jargon or legal legalese. Uh, but how can we actually know what uh, children want unless we listen to what children have to say, unless we help them understand what is happening in their lives, and unless we meet their needs at a time of intense emotional upheaval and that's why I was particularly struck uh, when you talked, and then the last speaker talked about uh, when relationships break up, and we need to look at that as well, and the supports that, that are provided here, because what struck me in the context of your, your, uh, the, uh, your, your traditional divorce, judicial separations, again, children are just airbrushed out of it, children are invisible. We want to protect children. And the same thing in this, in this debate, it's let's not listen to children because we really don't want to bother them with this. But children are key stakeholders in all of this. And children have a right to actually to have a say. And I think today's conference is a very important starting point. And we look at, I suppose, the, the international law in this area. And uh, I usually end up talking about the international law. I have the luxury now of my, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Vong, who's going to, to speak on that. But... Uh, suffice to state, and all I'm going to say is that Ireland signs up to several international instruments, and it all looks good because we send off whatever minister there is to, to sign this instrument, and Sheila made reference to the Convention on the Rights of the Child, as did, did Fergus this morning. 
But we fail to realize that when we sign international instruments, there must be follow through in the implementation of those international instruments. And one of the key international instruments uh, that has been incorporated as part of our domestic law is the European Convention on Human Rights. What struck me in the context of the European Convention of Human Rights is that many of uh, many areas in which we've seen social progress that has only has occurred as a result of cases taken before uh, the European Court of Human Rights. If you look at the Johnston case, which led to the Status of Children Act in 1987, the Keegan case, uh, which led to new adoption legislation. All of those cases, you know, have in many respects, we've been brought kicking and screaming, really, to, to, the, uh, to the table in terms of introducing new legislation. Now is an opportunity, really, to, to be proactive uh, in this area and uh, to bring about real change. Because at the moment, if you're asked to talk about legislation, there really is no legislation in this area, you know, protecting children. And where the legislative gaps are, like what I would start, I would start at... Uh, by looking at you know well, what immediate protections can be provided, basic issues. And I'll, I found myself at the foster care conference over a year ago, and a, a same-sex couple approached me saying, "Well, Johnny, you know, arrived home from school in September, and we were asked to uh, the the parent who was a guardian was actually away on holidays, and I was asked to sign the uh, the consent form for for Johnny to go on the school tour." Johnny couldn't go on the school tour because of the fact that the non-guardian parent couldn't sign the consent form. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it, who could object to, to providing you know, that level of rights? So it's not just this high-level constitutional rights, and we get into you know, these high-level rights, and I think you lose everybody at that stage, but those are the basic rights. You take it's another example, you know, Johnny Tripps goes to the hospital, you need to sign a consent form uh, for Johnny. Uh, the guardian parent isn't there. That can't be done. So there are clear child protection issues here that need now to be addressed as a matter of priority. My understanding at the moment is that the Law Reform Commission is looking at a host of issues uh, in this area. I'd like to say publicly that I hope the Law Reform Commission uh, Ad will address uh, this the issue of, of guardianship, uh, the issue of guardianship for uh, for parents in situations we're, we're dis discussing this morning. Um, will uh, make a recommendation having a regard to the fact that childhood doesn't stand still, and we don't have the luxury, we don't have time on our side in this area. So I'm not going to detain you much further. That, that's sort of a, a brief glimpse, a snapshot as to the areas. I want to touch on one final issue which hasn't been addressed, and it's the whole area of assisted reproductive technologies. The entire area totally unregulated. I know many people in this room, it's, it's directly relevant uh, to them. And uh, the failure to introduce legislation in this area, uh, could, in my opinion, could be described as reckless because of the fact that if we look at what's happening at the moment, uh, the entire area is unregulated uh, in the context of assisted reproductive technologies a child can have, you know, potentially five five parents. The the child with donor sperm, a donor egg, a surrogate parent, or the, the two commissioning parents. But there is one case in the states where the child had nine parents. So it's uh, and what happens then when you arrive back in, in this jurisdiction? There are key family issues need to be addressed, such as uh, parentage, custody and access, access to treatment and how the family should be defined. And there are challenging issues, and I'm not going to shy away from those challenging issues this morning, challenging child protection issues that need to be addressed. Uh, take, for example, infertility clinics. They're asked to determine whether to uh, provide treatment uh, in respect of a child that is yet to come into existence. And in the absence of regulation, that is troubling, because how can the best interests of a child be determined if the child has yet to come into existence? And we're relying on information uh, from from the parents. The question is, do we need, does there need to be an independent assessment? And uh, what are the criteria for assessing the best interests of the child? So we need to be honest up front, and we, we need to look at this generally, not just in the context of, of, of the issue this morning, but I think it's, it's relevant. Uh, but it's, again, another example of a failure to, to legislate. And that failure to legislate, in my opinion, leaves children incredibly vulnerable. Because if, we, if the starting point, and the starting point in any society must be legislating to protect children, 
And I found myself speaking at the, uh, when, we were, when Ireland was chairing the presidency, I was the, one of the keynote speakers at the, uh, at the conference hosted in, in, in Dublin Castle. And afterwards, the Dutch delegate actually said to me, uh, you know, your system is bizarre. And they're going, welcome to my world, in terms. Uh, uh, and she said, well, the, the approach we adopt is that we build rights around children, whereas in uh, Ireland, we build rights around adults, and we forget the children. And I just that I think that's, uh, that's incredibly to be regretted. I also feel uh, that this time to move away from from that approach and move to an approach where we build rights around the substance of the relationship rather than the form of the relationship. We need to depart from a system where legal status alone is the sole determinant of family rights and responsibilities. And which are, we should remember this. And something that sometimes I think the politicians and policymakers seem to forget is that children are the people of today, not people for tomorrow. And I really hope that this conference provides the impetus for change in this area. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>